Hey there, honey bunnies. Welcome to episode 49. Uh, the payoff for your pain. And this is the Sovereign Storytellers podcast with your host, Michelle Wolf. And my website, if you, if I say something that makes you think that we should work together, my website is that michellewolf.com, two L's, two F's. Um, and I, I have a cold today, um, so I thought, why not record a podcast when you can't think straight? That's a good idea. <laughs> but let's talk. I asked my daughter for a topic, and she said secondary gains from negative behavior, which is one of my favorite topics. The payoff for our pain. We are human beings, in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the remarkable ability to rationalize damn near anything. Honestly, if you need a, a rationalization for something, um, the gate for that I have active in my human design, and I'm real good at it. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to rationalize something, you let me know, and I'll help you find a way to make it okay. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so the payoff for our pain. A lot of p times people will go to therapy and pay good money. Was when I was a therapist, I didn't take insurance because it's a bunch of BS. And, you know, it was like, if you can, you know, if you want to pay cash, great, and I'll make it worth your while, but I'm not taking insurance. And as a coach, of course, there is no insurance. So we work in cash, credit, whatever. But a lot of people will pay good money to a therapist or a coach and then argue with the very person that they hired to help them see their blind spots. They'll argue to either that the blind spot isn't there um, or that um, there's a good reason for it to be there. Most often it's that there's a good reason. Like I, I have this pain because fill in the blank with one of a gazillion reasons to hang on to the pain this is the addictive quality of negative emotions and why we fight so hard to stay in our story even when we're chunking out our sweet moolah to have somebody help us one of my favorite things to do is and i encourage all everyone to do this is to go review the last six months of uh, people's facebook pages when you do that, especially if you're any kind of empath, which, you know, the ma large majority of people are, um, you can feel the energy of the pain that they're hanging on to. And there's a payoff for hanging on to that pain. And it's fucked up. <laughs> and we all do it. So we can't point fingers at each other like, you're hanging on to your pain because you like it and you're addicted to it and I'm so awesome and I don't do that which is complete garbage we all do it we all do it because we're getting something out of it secondary gains uh, sometimes called um, hidden payoffs or secondary payoffs it's it's this it's the hidden thing under the thing so I run a monthly group on Voxer using the one command to help people with their money. And people get results. And by the way, we start October 1st if you want to get in on it now. I also have a pa my Patreon page is active. And I'm going to go in later today and add this. But if you subscribe to my Patreon page at the $33 level, I'll throw in the one command group into the reward for that uh, the reward tier for that level so either way you can subscribe on the website that michellewolf.com forward slash 10 minutes one zero minutes or you can go to my patreon page patreon.com forward slash michelle wolf 11 subscribe at the 33 dollar level and you'll get the voxer group okay that's enough advertising <laughs> okay so i run this group and it's marketed as a money group because that's what gets our attention, right? We we hurt. We hurt. We're hurting. We're in pain, and our the thing within our vision that's air quotes causing the pain is our money situation, or relationships, or job, or 
food, health, weight, you know, whatever. It's it's the it's the outside thing that we're pointing our cute little fingers at and saying, it's your fault. You're the one causing my pain, you stupid dollar dollar bill. You stupid partner, boss, colleague, neighbor. It's your fault that I'm in pain. Mom, dad, siblings. Weight, the number on the scale, the number in the bank. It's, it's something outside of us that we identify as the source of our pain, which is the ridiculousness of being a human being. We can't see ourselves. Looking glass. Uh, who did the looking glass theory of self? Gl- uh, starts with a G. Can't remember. I want to say glasser, but that doesn't sound right. But my head's all clogged up, so who knows? Anyway, looking glass self. Go Google it. We hang on to our limitations because in our deepest part of our brain our primary objective is to stay alive and to stay safe and if we haven't proven to ourselves that we can feel safe and stay alive with no money then we will desperately hang on to the structures that are actually preventing us from having more money that is keeping us locked where we're at If we can't see that for ourselves, and most of the time we can't, especially if it's a chronic thing that you've been struggling with for years or decades, you're in a blind spot. You're in a loop that you can't see, and you're just going to have to take my word for that. (laughs) I'm a projector. I know what I'm talking about. Projector in human design. I could insert another commercial here, but I'll leave it up to you to visit the website. Um, I need to hire someone to do commercials for me. Commercial break. Anyway, projectors are known for being able to see what the real problem is. I can go through your Facebook page and tell you what the real problem is. That you are invested in and hanging on to your fear. doesn't matter how you dress it up. It doesn't matter what words you use. The underlying tone of the things you're posting is really obvious to uh, everybody else but you. (laughs) And it's especially obvious to a a coach or a therapist who's trained to see those things, to feel those things, to identify those things. It's the payoff we get for our pain is our imaginary safety. I'm okay because nobody knows who I am. I'm okay because I'm I'm uh, uh, posting a spiritual things, uh, and everybody likes them, and so I'm part of this spiritual tribe, whichever branch that you're hanging out in. So therefore, I'm okay. I'm advertising, and uh, somebody famous liked my post, and therefore I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm all right. Here's how you know when you're in a blind spot: is when something out of the blue happens that is what you've been looking for and you make sure that you don't keep it that or you might get it and then immediately get rid of it somehow or another typically blaming an external problem or you might come close to getting it and do something stupid to make sure you don't get it <laughs> Like your dream job might come and you oversleep and miss the interview. Or you're so excited you get drunk the night before with your friends and show up to the interview and you can't think straight because you've got hangover idiot brain. Um, Or you completely forget all your skills and you stumble and stammer over your answers because your brain is like, "Uh uh-oh, Hold the phone, people. Something's about to go right. uh, And that's going to be scary. And we don't do scary around here. So uh, make sure she stutters and forgets her 20 years of training. Or he. Make sure he uh, gets tongue-tied and sounds like, you know, uh, that he's got a head full of cotton instead of a very skilled brain and skill set. (laughs) 
make sure we fuck this up. Okay, everybody? All right. So our investment in hanging on to our pain is greater than what we say we want. This happens with weight loss, too. You stick to your plan, and you're doing great, and you get on the scale, and you're five pounds lighter, and that deepest part of you is like, holy shit, we're about to lose our safety net of focusing on weight as the problem everything in our life sucks ass. Oh, I'm pretty mouthy today. I guess I'll have to check the explicit button <laughs> on the podcast. Oh, you guys have such a cold. Um, feeling sorry for myself. Feeling sorry for yourself can be a chronic safety net thing. Uh, self-deprecating humor can be something that I've certainly been addicted to at different points in my life. If I'm in feeling insecure, then it's easier and anticipating criticism. It's easier to go ahead and grab the anticipating anticipated criticism and turn it into a joke and then uh, like nobody can then attack me with it because I've already put it out in the room in relationships if you're scared of relationships even though you're desperately searching for one you will uh, create situations where you leave that relationship first because you think they're going to leave you and so you're going to do you know the Donald Trump thing where I didn't I didn't fire you I mean, you didn't fire me. I fired you. You didn't break up with me. I broke up with you. <laughs> Let's deflect and make sure we never feel. So if you're working with a coach or a therapist and they've pointed out to you, hey, oh, everything you're talking about is, is really negative, even though you're using positive words. Um, everything that you're posting and reading is really fear-based even though you say you're focused on love all the time. So we, we're not aware of it. It's not, it's not unusual. It doesn't make you defective. It actually makes you really normal because we are designed to have a, a container that we live in and anything that pokes a hole in that container has to be rapidly patched. And from the outside, you know, a professional can see you doing that and point it out to you. And then based on your where you're at in true investment to change, you'll f argue about it or you'll say, oh, I, I don't see that. Let me go look. Let me go meditate. Let me go take, you know, try to take as an objective view as possible as to what I'm writing about or have written about in my journal for the last six months or whatever. You have to be willing to feel the fear of exposure. You have to be willing to let go of the um, familiar bad feeling place, your negativity binky, your self-pity pacifier. Okay, if you're not willing to feel the embarrassment or the shame of it or the discomfort of being caught out sabotaging yourself, then you're never going to get there. You have to be willing to acknowledge that you're getting something out of your shitty diaper sitting in your shitty diaper you have to acknowledge that you you're choosing to be there and for whatever reason you're pretty comfortable there and you like it there's part of you that likes it there's part of you that likes the pity party because it gives you an excuse to go eat Ben and Jerry's talking to myself y'all <laughs> you know how how am I going to justify eating Ben and Jerry's if I don't feel like something horrible has happened and I need to um, medicate or something fantabulous has happened and I need to celebrate. I don't actually do that now. Now I just say, hey, I'm going to eat some Ben and Jerry's. Oh, yes, look at that Cherry Garcia. And I'm totally aware of it. I take responsibility for it like a grown-up. <laughs> and there's very few areas that I'm a grown-up in. So, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I hear you. I do it too. We all do it. We all have blind spots. That's why we hire coaches and go to therapy. is because we can see that something is very, very wrong. <laughs> and we can't figure out why we resist doing the things that would make it better. I'm just coming out of a very, very dark depression that actually scared me enough that I was going to go, um, that I was thinking about 
maybe going to get some antidepressants because I couldn't shake it. Nothing I was doing was working. It turned out it was Zyrtec related, which, by the way, it's very hard to find the research that shows that Zyrtec and Claritin and things like that can um, lead to feelings of worthlessness and very bad depression. So if you're struggling with depression and weight gain, you might want to hit the Google or you can find the poge, the poge, the post on my page. <laughs> Let's just combine words um, and see the discussion. There's several links listing that research. But I had to put on the mirror. I mean, some good things came out of it. I had to put on the mirror, though. Um, I refuse to say one mean word to you. Because how often are we aware of how bad our thoughts can really be when we're in front of a mirror and plus I could see it several times a day so and I also wrote on there I chose to get here and since I have the power to choose again what do I want to choose now all your choices have brought you here to wherever you are listening to this podcast which means you can choose again So the good things that came out of that depression is I thought it was money really facing the feelings I avoid through worrying about money. And that's true. Like that was happening also. And so it got so bad, I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't stay in my familiar bad feeling because my familiar bad feeling felt like, you know, sitting in a bucket of hot oil. It was bad. I was like, I can't go on like this this is terrible like this is the worst ever and so it forced me in a sense or rather I chose to say okay I'm not gonna run from this anymore I'm gonna sit and meditate for two hours every day which I did and have been doing which helped me see that I was avoiding feeling those feelings and they're just feelings you all know that it's just energy It's just an energy I'm not used to because I didn't stop letting myself feel that way long, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. (laughs) Okay, so the badness of it, the horribleness of it hurt enough that I was able to stop and say, okay, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to face this and I'm going to feel it and I'm going to recognize it. And in that process, I was like, oh, there's something else going on here because this isn't getting better. When you sit and feel, authentically feel your emotions as deeply as possible and you don't smother them with whatever your favorite addiction is, they go away. They do resolve. You can't try, you can't sit down, I'm going to feel my feelings so that they'll go away. That doesn't work. I've tried that one. Let me save you some time and effort. (laughs) It doesn't work. Um, But when you truly, truly feel them and you see that it's nothing to be afraid of, you then, you know, slip over into that incredibly peaceful, grounded, calm space. But this didn't. Like I could feel one piece of it shifted and then this other thing was going on. But it's interesting, right? Because after it shifted, I was like, hey, I wonder if this stupid Zyrtec is messing me up. Is it messes my daughter up. She can't take anything. She just has to deal with a sinus effect infection twice a year. And I stopped taking it. And by the third day, I was like, oh, wow, I'm human again. I feel like a, I'm fine. And now five days later, I have a cold, which so I don't feel super fine. But mentally, I'm like, oh, wow, that was really bad. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but when we, so facing that pain, saying, I'm not going to eat my way out of this pain. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to feel it and make it okay. And make space for it at a completely different level than I had before. Because I stopped pointing to the money as the problem. I stopped letting myself think victim-y thoughts. I stopped letting myself open the door to the familiar bad feeling place. Because I'm over it. I'm done. I've got things to do. And if I'm hanging out in the familiar bad feeling place, I'm never going to get to do those things. One of which is to do live coaching and 
make y'all laugh and coach you in person and have a big group thing and it's fun. It's a little Kyle C's style, but wolf style. And the first one of that, in case you're anywhere near Greenville, South Carolina on October 12th, you can stop in and wear your jammies. I'm going to be wearing my pajamas. <laughs> it's called Cosmic Clarity Night. It's going to be a blast. Anyway, I want to do more of those. And I can't do more of those if I'm sabotaging myself, which I hate that word. So let's say more invested in staying safe than feeling the thing more invested in keeping my payoffs for the pain rather than saying oh I'm acting like a martyr or oh I'm uh, viewing the external world as a scary scary place that has all the power over how I feel today or, oh, I'm going to just give all my power away to money so that when I look at the bank, I can feel terrible and stay in my familiar zone. It's a payoff. We're, get, we're getting something out of our pain. Otherwise, we don't stay in pain. You know, if you don't have a thing about being treated like crap in relationships, you don't stay in those relationships. And in fact, if you really don't have a thing about it, you just don't have those relationships. They just don't even cross your path. You just don't even meet up with the kind of people that would be willing to do the, you know, the pain dance with you. That's also how you know when you're really over something is those patterns stop. That's another way to find your blind spot. Where are the patterns in your life? Where, where are the places where you go, not this again? You change jobs and you're like, oh my God, I just left this boss and here he is again here she is again with a different face in a different place but the same damn person the same damn thing what are the themes in your behavior what do you keep doing even though you know it's not what you want to do you're doing it because you feel compelled there's a compulsive quality there's a grasping desperate quality to your actions to the things that you read to the things that you talk about to the conversations you let yourself get into there's an addictive component to it where we're wallowing in the payoff for the pain so how do you find your way out of that awareness 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 and you know what i'm going to say next you have to have a daily practice you have to have a time every single day for the rest of your life where you experience the silence with yourself and silence not listening to music not doing yoga not playing a guided meditation sitting with yourself in silence we are very 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 crafty we're crafty we get around we're crafty why do i always want to sing beastie boys songs to you we're crafty. We're clever. We're super, super, super smart. We're so smart that we fuck ourselves up constantly. Because why? We can rationalize it. But I have to because. But I'm poor because. But I'm overweight because. I have all these valid reasons. And I want you to agree with me so I can keep doing my behavior. But a good coach is going to say, uh, nope. Uh, nope, that funny thing you just posted is directly related to the thing you say you want to change. Oh, that scary article you just posted, that update you just posted, that's directly related to your blind spot. It's right there, it's right there, it's right there, it's right there. If you really want to change, you'll be like, damn, I didn't even know that was there. Shit. I don't want to feel embarrassed about being a victim, about wallowing in victim. Who wants to do that? Nobody wants to feel like a spineless little weakling. Nobody wants to own that we regularly throw pity parties. Nobody wants to own that. Um, I'm weak and spineless. <laughs> I'm blaming everyone else and everything else for my weak and spineless 
pity party thing so that I can continue to feel the nice brain cocktail that is labeled um, pity party in a, a lovely martini glass. Right? No, we don't want to own that. Gross. What's, the fir- what's your first response when someone is feeling sorry for themselves? It's repulsive. It's repulsive because we intuitively know it's not healthy. It's an energetic yuck because we know that that is not the truth of that person. They're not weak. They're not pitiful. They're not helpless. And it's gross when we do that. It's gross when other people do it. And it's gross when we do it to ourselves. It's yucky. It's good that we find it yucky because it's not how it's supposed to be. That's the part of us that's like, oh, honey, that's not healthy. (laughs) Oh, honey bunnies, don't do that. It's Oh, it's yucky, honey, don't. It's like we tell toddlers, don't put that in your mouth, it's icky. Don't eat the dog food, no, yuck. (laughs) When my daughter was like, I don't know, seven or eight months old, she was crawling. I came home from the grocery store and my ex-husband was washing dishes and she was behind him playing on the floor, but she was playing eating the cat food, the wet cat food that was like chopped up fish heads. They don't make that kind anymore, which is a shame because it's really good for cats, but she had like a mouthful of fish head. (laughs) Ew, no, we freak out about that, right? So what icky fish head cat food are you feeding your brain? What are you consuming? If you want to read about the impeachment drama, pop in, read it, and then get out. And also, don't get too excited. Like, these processes take forever. (laughs) And we know that this guy can squirm his way out of just about anything. So, you know, pop in, get your news dose, get the hell out. What are you allowing yourself to think about? And when you get to the stage where you know you're doing it, when you know you're indulging and you do it anyway, that's a really critical place to be. It's a really critical place to whip out your biggest bucket of compassion. Until you see yourself indulging in the thing, you can't change it. I can tell you that it's there and you might even come into a clarity session and really see it. And then you hang up the phone and it's gone again. That's okay. It's part of the process. That's why a lot of people will say, well, I went to therapy and it didn't work. Oh, it worked all right. (laughs) Even a crappy therapist can usually identify where your blind spot is and, and point it out to you. They might not be able to guide you into getting out of it, but they can usually find it. I would hope. I could be wrong about that. When you see yourself acting in your addiction, you're on the road to freedom if you will be kind to yourself. If you'll put that note on the mirror that says, I refuse to to say shitty things to you. I refuse to say one mean word to you. I refuse to talk to you like you're dog shit. Okay? You've got to see yourself doing it. You've got to see how you're, you're activated and where you make those micro decisions of taking your power or relinquishing your power to the bag of cookies or the uh, p- uh, bong or the, you know, pick a fight with your partner or whatever it is that you do to yourself. Don't get regular oil changes and then be surprised when your car blows up right when your tax refund shows up. You know, it's that dumb stuff. If you trace it back, you can go, oh, yeah, I actually did kind of set myself up for that. Bummer, dude. When you see it, when you hear the voice in your head that says, hey, you said you didn't want to engage in fear-based focus, and yet you're scanning, constantly scanning the police reports. You're always looking at crime statistics. Do you see yourself doing that? And do you see how it keeps you in the energy of fear, which is your familiar bad feeling place? When you can see it and you choose it, consciously choose it, man, you're making some good progress then. So don't beat yourself up if you say, shit, 
I said I wasn't going to eat the cheese fries. I said I wasn't going to eat those. Damn it. <laughs> Where did this empty bag of cookies come from? Who ate all these cookies? <laughs> How many of us have done? Who ate all this ice cream? Why is there an empty carton of ice cream in my hand? Who? How did this happen? <laughs> when you can see how it happens, oh, I, I posted a course and, and nobody came. <laughs> or, oh, people said they wanted a thing and I made it, but then it didn't, it didn't sell. <laughs> Those are the things that can trip me up. Oh, well, courses don't. I mean, I've, I've created in so many courses and experienced that, you know, crickets so many times that it really doesn't bother me anymore. Now it's just like, hey, this sounds cool. Oh, it didn't go anywhere. Okay. Oh, hey, this sounds cool. Oh, that sold a few and I get some people to coach. That's fun. That's what I live for. So that's no big, no big whoop. But it used to be the thing the outside of me that I would then hand my power over to and use that as a reason to get in you know activate my particular addictive brain chemical cocktail what do you choose even though you know it's going to make you feel bad so just own it oh I'm choosing to eat Burger King oh please don't and please don't do that by the way ew don't put that in your mouth, honey bunny. It's icky. <laughs> what are you choosing that you know is anti what you say you want? If you say you want a business and you don't put yourself out there, why? What's the energy of the avoidance? Why are you trying to stay safe? by indulging in imposter syndrome and procrastination and, you know, fill in the blank. See yourself doing it. Be honest with yourself that you're choosing an addictive behavior. Give yourself a big giant hug and watch it. Observe it. If you can observe it with compassion, oh, I see that you're looking at the bank account and then telling yourself a story about being a loser. Hmm. That's fascinating. Why would you sit here and tell yourself a story that makes you feel horrendous? Oh, I see that you're on a dating website and no one sent you whatever people send you on dating websites. And I see that you're telling yourself a story about how unlovable and you are and how you're never going to find anyone. That's interesting. Why are you sitting there telling yourself a story that makes you cry? Why are you doing that? What's the energy of it? What's familiar about that? Where did you learn that? When did you first experience that? Would you like to let it go? Would you like to tell yourself a different story? got to see the story that you're telling now if you want to tell a different one that's the title of this podcast is sovereign storytellers we need to be sovereign in the stories that we're telling ourselves we need to know the stories that we're telling ourselves so we can choose hey do i want to keep telling this old saw or do i want to make up another one maybe i'd like to tell a completely different story if we don't have a template for the story we're trying to tell we can get caught up in that too like if you're trying to be experience a, a life of abundance but you don't know anybody and nobody in your family has money that's it's harder it really is you have to go out and find those templates you have to figure out what's the energy signature of wealth what does that feel like you'll find it outside yourself to begin with but it's really all inside of you now and if you could stop telling that story about being poor then and count, you know, start looking at the abundance you're actually surrounded by, then that can fuel you to go, oh, I'm actually quite wealthy. I'm actually listening to a podcast on a smartphone, which means I'm actually not living under a bridge with a bunch of bags and some Twinkies. I'm actually, I'm, I'm fine. So this one command group, you know, I... Actually, I'm getting paid to do my daily practice, which is hilarious. 
serving you and serving me. It's awesome. But it has taken a long time of being committed to it to really see how deeply embedded the um, payoff for poverty, well, let's say payoffs, plural, for poverty were really in there. You know, really, really, really embedded. Really wrapped up in a lot of uh, chemical brain mixes that I've been highly addicted to. Corey Michelle calls it energetic priorities. And some of you know that I started out this online thing by teaching Cortisar feeling workshops. I had a license from Danielle Laporte, but and then I, you know, started doing my own thing. But uh, energetic priorities are uh, roughly like Cortisar feelings, except I really prefer that word energy because. Once you say the word emotion, you've already triggered some stories. Emotions are yuck. Emotions are gross. Emotions are, you know, or I'm always in, I'm so emotional. You're actually probably acting out an addictive emotion and you have a whole nother range of emotions underneath there. But anyway, so I like the term energetic priority better because core desired feeling is like, yeah, cool. We can get that. But if we start to think about emotions as energy, which I know I yammer about that all the time, because it's true. But if we think about it as energy, we're already like taking some of those charges off the word emotion and feeling. And then priority, we all understand what a priority is. Now, core desired feelings, you have to make a priority. But if you just think of it as energetic priority, then you've already got it built in. Oh, I'm choosing an energy. Anger is an energy. Sadness is an energy. Uh, calmness is an energy. Wealth is an energy. Love is an energy. I'm choosing which energy do I want to feel. And you're just shifting over from one energy to another, which kind of starts to circumvent the blaming, shaming process that we do to ourselves. <coughs> You can uh, go to meetcoreymichelle.com or, damn it, I always space out her website. Just go Google it. Go on Facebook. She's like me. She's everywhere. <laughs> we like to share our stuff. And our stuff's really good. And her stuff's really good. And my stuff's really good. And lots of you have really good stuff. And if you weren't so invested in the payoffs that your pain is giving you, we'd see more of you. So what are you getting? Be willing to feel the shame when you catch yourself with your hand in a cookie jar. <laughs> Be willing to own that you've done it to yourself. Yeah, somebody probably started that pattern for you way back yonder in the old days. But you can see it for what it is now and forgive whoever needs to be forgiven, including yourself. Settle down with the shame. And start to look at it. Oh, I'm taking these pain pills long after the pain is gone because I like the cocoony feeling that muffles the world. How else can I take control of what energies I'm receiving from outside? Hmm, I wonder if I could start a meditation practice or go see a therapist or train in tolerating energies different levels of energy different streams of energy in my physical body if you turned off the ability to feel joy when you were three when you go flip that switch again doesn't it make sense that you'd be like ew ew what is this ew god i don't know this feeling i don't know this energetic space yuck i'm gonna shut this down i'm gonna go um pick a fight with my partner so that I can feel mad again or sad again or whatever you're used to feeling. And then you can conveniently blame your partner rather than you just didn't know you're not familiar with the energy of happiness. You don't have, you have a pretty low threshold. That was my first tagline. Helping you raise your happiness threshold. <laughs> it's true. We, we have a very low threshold for abundance until we decide to consciously raise our ability to feel the energy of wealth coursing through our physical body and not freak out and not go running 
and flinging open the door and diving into the familiar or bad feeling place. Okay, now I feel like I'm just rambling and repeating myself. Plus, I don't feel very good. So, <laughs> I'm going to show myself some love and go lie down. Stop talking. Okay, so uh, my original point for the money group, which I totally got sidetracked off of, is that people come and join that group to work on their money issues and find out it's actually abandonment. Or find out that it's actually they're addicted to fear or find out they're actually addicted to arrogance or whatever distancing thing they use to avoid intimacy, to avoid feeling energy. Okay. So we always are going to go for the thing. That's why marketing to pain points works. It's because in the beginning, we don't really understand that it's not about the money. It's about the mommy. (laughs) It's not about your partner. It's about your papa. Oh, how many other weird things can we say? Let's have a pun more. Okay, now I can't think of one because I was trying to. (laughs) All right, you can find everything that I do. The money group starts, and it's not about the money. But if you're struggling with money, man, what a great portal. What a great portal to jump into your blind spots is to start working on your money issues because that shit will wake you right up. <clears throat> it's only 33 bucks. So you can join on the website, thatmichellewolf.com forward slash 10 minutes, or you can go to my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash michellewolf11. If you sign up at the $33 level, either place, then go put Voxer on your phone. The Voxer app, it's free. Send me your Voxer name. I'll add you and we'll get started October 1st, where daily all you have to do is show up and listen. I'm doing the talking because that's my favorite thing to do. Um, and you know, it works on you just listening. And then I have, um, the next human design basics for business class starts October 9th. That's a fun thing to get overviews of human design and get, get practical coaching on your particular issues in a group with the group energy, which by the way too, I'm just, I, uh, I don't know if I put it on the website, but I am offering a discount for groups of eight or more. Because it's a great team building thing. If you've got an MLM team or a direct marketing team or really any kind of team that are struggling, understanding each other through your human design chart is an incredible way to just dissolve conflict. Because once you understand that the other person is designed that way, then you know what language to use with yourself and with them to create some ease and some grace. All right, enough. Think less, feel more, and I will talk to you next week. Come and find me. Come and chat if you have questions or concerns. Okay, bye.